So today we'll talk about how we can distribute our workflows across multiple GPUs, whether it's across multiple machines or whether it's on a single node. So the idea of Dask is that it provides us with a single Python API, which allows us to enable parallel processing of when you, which is especially important when we are working with really large data sets where essentially we become memory bound or compute bound and to enable the power of using multiple nodes and multiple gpus we use dask so what is dask so dask is essentially a distributed compute scheduler which is built to scale in python the idea is that you want to write your code on your laptop and then you can simply scale it to a supercomputing cluster. So, and the idea is that you want to use multiple workers, and this really helps, especially with rapids, when you have one worker per GPU model. So you you will have the number of workers set to the number of GPUs we have. And why Dask? What are the advantages that Dask offers us? A major advantage that Dask offers us is Py data nativity, which what that means is that the APIs that we are already familiar with, whether it's NumPy, Panda, Scikit-Learn, we can easily translate those APIs across multiple nodes as the API itself almost remains the same. So the user kind of becomes agnostic to the fact that your code is right now running on a sing single uh, GPU or a single CPU or across N nodes. It's easily deployable, whether it's if it's you are deploying it on a high performance computing cluster with Slurm or on cloud with Kubernetes. And the, I and another important part of it is that the people who are working on developing Dask are almost the same people that are really involved in the Pi Data and SciPy community. So which what this translates is to the API consistency remains the same whether we are using Dask or NumPy or Scikit-Learn. So let's look at an example about how uh, we can use uh, Dask with Pandas data frames or how do Pandas data frames translate into a Dask data frame. In this example, we can see that our data frames essentially are partitioned by months. So you can imagine here we have six data frames. All these data frames might be sitting across multiple machines, or they may be on the same machine. And all of them combined make a single last data frame. If you want to exit our pandas data frames and unlock the power of our GPU, we can just switch out our pandas data frame with a QDF data frame and everything else on the API layer remains the same. But just the underlying uh, data structure changes from a pandas data frame to a QDF data frame. Now let's look at how a NumPy array will look like when you're working with Dask. Uh, and now, so essentially we again will have multiple partitions. Here the example is a 2D NumPy array, but essentially it can be an n-dimensional NumPy array, which will be which will be partitioned. And essentially Dask array becomes a wrapper around those, uh, around those partitions. Again, if, when you want to go from NumPy to QPy so that we can get pa better parallelism with our GPUs, we simply translate it, translate our NumPy arrays into QPy arrays, and the overall API remains the same. So now let's look slightly under the hood about how all of this happens and what are the, how does the Dask actually provide you uh, with, uh, with scheduling across multiple nodes and multiple workers? The, I, the idea here is that we split out our execution part from our task graph creation part. In this example, you can see that you have, uh, if you wanted to create a NumPy array of say length 15, we can, we simply call np.ones. If you want to do the same thing in Dask, 
you simply call the das array or da dot ones with size equal to 15 but there's another argument here that's important which is chunks so here we set our chunk size as five what this translates to is that we want to chunk our numpy arrays a of into each of length five but at this point when we create x equal to da dot ones we essentially haven't created anything this is just a task graph that we create so when we execute the task graph it only it's only then when these will actually be executed and then they will be uh, they will come in memory and then the processing will become this essentially is a lazy operation so at this point this we only have this task graph now let's look at a slightly a small computation that we do on the numpy arrays here essentially we call sum on the previous array that previous array we have created how the task graph for this changes is that we now have a reduction operation here so this reduction will look similar to those of you who have experience with maps that use is sim is similar to the reduction that's happening here in dask now so that's essentially if we look at this the api is fairly simple and it will be similar to what you write in numpy land but under the hood das will create a complex task graph for you so this is an example of a statistical computation and you can see how that task graph gets created now let's look at now we have learned how the graph is created now let's try to understand how we actually schedule computing of that graph task offers us really nice visual debugging as well as debugging tools which allows us to actually see how the scheduling is happening right now in this task graph which is essentially a graph of a machine learning workflow we can see that so the red here signifies the stuff that we have to hold in memory and the blue here signifies the uh, stuff that's already being scheduled and is now is freed up so does is the dask scheduler essentially handles all the garbage collection for us so all the task orchestration as well as uh, clear as well as memory management is all taken care of by the dask distributed scheduler so the scheduler essentially will tell okay so on this end worker please schedule this task and once the task is completed and if the memory is no longer needed on scene just free up the task also because the scheduler is a single threaded scheduler and it essentially is responsible for scheduling which task goes to which graph this is important because this allows us to do cool stuff like that the locality so that we all see we reduce our transfer overheads okay now let's see how we will actually create our dask cluster creating dask cluster is essentially the api all remains is just this the what we see on our screen this api should remain constant whether we are doing it on our local machine or, or should be similar or we are doing on a really big cluster those of you who will go in the lab after this will see or have already experimented will see how we can create a local CUDA cluster and that essentially should translate as well as when you are doing it on a multiple uh, multi-node system where you essentially you switch out to your local CUDA cluster to a different class let's if you are doing this on kubernetes you can essentially create the cluster from cluster by using this statement an important thing to note here is that the downstream code remains the same so you really don't have to worry whether you essentially load it on your laptop or you wrote it on somewhere else or it's being deployed somewhere else because the cluster creation step is essentially these four lines and everything else downstream just remains the same now as the another thing to note is a lot of times when you're working on multi-node workflows communication often becomes a bottleneck in dask 
natively we use tcp sockets for communicating uh, data between workers or from a scheduler to a worker what ucx or unified communication provides us is it allows us to access any hardware acceleration we have on a communication so this may use underlying hardware speed, uh, hardware like nv link or infiniband and to enable using ucx on dask our team rapids wrote python bindings for ucx ucx natively was in c++ but we wrote python bindings and what this unblocks for us is that we can now use it with dask for a python based communication now let's look at an example where this becomes important. So in the task scene that you see, again, all of these will be available on our dashboard you'll see in the lab. And you can actually see how your tasks are being scheduled as well as that. So in this example, we have four workers and we are doing a SVD with QPy arrays lying underneath. If we are doing it just for TCP, like these blue teal color tasks are some computation that we are doing and the red here is communication as you can see here after our initial computation the communication becomes our, our bottleneck once we switch our, out our tcp to ucx that bottleneck goes away and we bring out our task time from 25 seconds to 17 seconds why this is important is that a lot of times our workflows become become really a communication bottleneck and with ucx you we even accelerate that part another important thing to note from a user's perspective is that starting ucx is essentially almost as same as starting a tcp cluster you just switch out the commute the tcp argument the, or the protocol argument where you see to from tcp to ucx and everything else just works out of the box so the idea of the of this presentation is like we saw how we can get speed ups on single nodes with rapid i either by using num on uh, qpy qdf qml and number and now when we want to unblock a bigger workflow that A, I don't fit on a single machine, or B, a communication bottleneck and a require multiple GPUs, we can do them with Dask without a lot of code changes. Okay, now, and how do we get the software? I think this should have been covered in previous parts too, but we have our own GitHub page uh, GitHub, and because Zapage is an open source project, so you can look at what is in development on that. And installing any of our libraries, is even in, including us, is as simple as calling installing Anaconda packages. So you can look at Anaconda Rapids for our releases. And that's all I have for you right now. And I'm open to any questions about the workflows you have or Dask in general. Thanks, Fabu. Uh, does anybody have questions? If so, uh, please type them in the chat. Well, so, so far, no questions. <laughs> I'm open to discussing any workflows that you think you have right now that require multiple nodes and, okay. Uh, all right, well, we have one question uh, from Roland. So he would like to know uh, when you might choose Dask over MPI, like kind of a uh, pros and cons. Okay. So the I so essentially, I think MP. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so in I think in PyData universe, it's not very straightforward to use MPI. With Dask, you can you get almost all the benefits of MPI if you are using UCX. So if you are working with PyData libraries, I think you it's just easier to use Dask for that uh, communication. 
one, one just another, excuse me, one additional input there. Um, so, I, you know, there's, you know, MPI for Pi is, is useful, but it, to Vibu's point, it's, it's, it can be limiting um, or difficult. But one particular difference is really what I would kind of describe as loose versus tight coupling. Um, so like the MPI parallel, parallelism model is like pretty tightly defined. Um, and that's, that's fantastic. It provides a lot of benefits through its guarantees. Dask has a very flexible relationship with parallelism. Um, and as a result of that, it means you can use Dask in areas where you might not be able to as cleanly use MPI. Um, and when you can use both of them in certain areas, Dask can perform extremely well still. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility that Dask provides out of the box that would be very difficult to uh, consistently and cleanly do with a different paradigm. Okay, uh, great. So we have uh, some more questions. So do you have, uh, Johannes asks, do you have any advice on how to use Dask in conjunction with a project that has already implemented some pieces in MPI for Pi? Uh, yes, we do. Um, rather than talk about that here, because I think that's a really deep conversation that might be worth a follow-up perhaps later, um, I can instead say that there is actually an example of this, um, and there's a library in the Dask repository on GitHub called Dask MPI. Um, which is something that I encourage you to look into, and perhaps we can chat about that later. Okay, great. Uh, so we have a next question, and uh, Humital asks, is it easy to use MPI with scikit-learn? So I think more uh, maybe a CPU question. Uh, personally, I'm, I'm not sure um, offhand of how cleanly MPI and scikit-learn work together. I suspect that someone has done some exploring on that, um, but I don't know offhand. Okay, fair. Uh, so Roland asked, uh, data parallel, oh no, he's answering, I guess Roland's answering. Okay, um, continue. Okay, great. Um, I think if there's no more questions or if there's continuing questions, we can, we can keep going with them while we also shift toward the notebooks. Um, we can do that, and I'll just remind everyone that we've reserved uh, half an hour at the end for open questions. So that's that's a good time to ask anything about any of these topics. So uh, don't if you don't ask your question right away, don't worry, you you haven't missed your chance. Awesome. Great. Uh, well, Babu, thanks for presenting this. Um, if you don't mind relinquishing the screen, I will take over for the notebooks. Awesome.